I'm Jeff Jarvis from the Newmark Graduate School of Journalism at CUNY with a few thoughts about expertise for remote reporters in this crisis. Now, the last crisis we fought in journalism was political disinformation. Our weapons included fact-checking, and our job was not to amplify the disinformation. This crisis, the pandemic, is different. Dr. Claire Wardle at First Draft says much of the disinformation she's seen now is not so much from malign actors as it is often from innocent and even well-meaning ignorance. Well, ignorance is an enemy we know how to fight in journalism. Our allies in that fight are experts. Our job is to amplify expertise. I often say that journalists are not experts. Journalists should be expert at finding experts. And today, thanks to the internet and social media, and particularly Twitter, we have new ways to find sources of credible information for the public we serve. Weeks ago, I started a COVID Twitter list, compiling credentialed experts with relevant experience who are active on social media. This includes more than 500 epidemiologists, virologists, infectious disease physicians, frontline doctors, researchers in related fields, university programs, NGOs, and a few specialist medical and science journalists. You can find my Twitter list at bit.ly slash COVID Twitter list. And then I started interviewing some of those experts to get their advice on how journalism should be covering this crisis. You can find those interviews on my blog at buzzmachine.com. One of those experts is Dr. Kutika Kupali. She is the vice chair of the Global Health Committee of the Infectious Diseases Society of America, and she's a biosecurity fellow at the Johns Hopkins University Center for Health Security. She is also a veteran of the Ebola outbreak. Here is her advice on finding expertise. Uh, how should we judge uh, what we see passing by in medical Twitter, in expert Twitter, not in idiot Twitter, but in expert <laughs> Twitter? Um, and before starting to do with a story, how should we approach that and what should, how should we come to the experts? Sure. I think that's a really good question. And I do definitely do think it's a challenge. Um, I think, you know, one of the things that you can always do is um, when you see somebody um, who is con a considered a quote unquote expert, um, I always think it's a good idea to look up their credentials. And especially in this particular case, you want somebody who's going to have infectious diseases experience. May they be an epidemiologist or a clinician. You're going to want somebody who's got virology experience. Um, I think those types of things are very important. Um, I think it's also really important to keep in mind that um, not all physicians are the same, right? And so um, infectious diseases is a very specialized field. And so you wouldn't want somebody who's a surgeon necessarily talking about infectious diseases, just like you wouldn't want me as an infectious disease doctor talking about surgery. Um, it's not what I do. Um, so you wanna make sure that the people that you're going to have the appropriate uh, background and the appropriate um, history. And I think that's the other important thing is you wanna make sure that the people who've been doing this are not quote unquote new to the game. Uh, whenever you have something such as this that is um, for lack of a better word, high profile, you're gonna have people that are opportunistic both on both sides, both on the um, media side, but also in our profession. And I think it's incumbent on uh, people on both sides to make sure that they're speaking and getting accurate truth out there. So it's important for the journalists to do their job, uh, but I would like to think and hope that people in my profession are going to represent themselves accurately um, but you can't always count on that. So everybody has to do their vetting on both sides. Here's how I went about building my list of experts on Twitter. It was surprisingly easy to find these experts online and before long to judge them and decide who should and should not be on my list. I looked, of course, for their credentials, checking their Twitter profiles and links there for relevant degrees and jobs and the institutions with which they are associated a virologist at Columbia or Emory, an epidemiologist at the University of Washington or Yale. During this process, it so happens that Twitter asked for help in verifying some of these experts, getting them their blue check marks. Twitter also looked at their credentials and verified that they had email addresses at their institutions. So verification can be a useful signal, just one signal. I checked to see whether they were tweeting much and whether they had a lot to say that was relevant with clear interest and experience in the field and also whether they were good at explaining what they know. Some quickly stood out. One of the first I came to admire for the clarity of her views 
was Dr. Devi Sridhar, Chair of Global Public Health at the University of Edinburgh. I watched a video of hers from two years ago warning of just what we're seeing now. But with a core of experts like her to start with, it was not hard to gather more. These are academicians and scientists who are accustomed to citing their sources. They do so generously as a matter of professional ethics, which is a lesson, by the way, that we in journalism should still learn better. So through their links and likes and comments, I could find the experts they respected and trusted. I could find experts in related fields they called upon, bioethicists, medical history scholars, biologists. I found institutions and projects that matter. One that amazes me is called Next Strain, which tracks the evolution of the pathogen's genome as it travels across the world. I found that by following a brilliant young postdoc who works on the project in Basel named Dr. Emma Hodcroft. She happens to be very good at Twitter. I also found the journalists the experts trust, such as Helen Branswell of Stat News and Kai Kupferschmidt at Science Magazine. Sadly, of course, there are too few science and medicine journalists today, especially in local newsrooms, where their absence will be sorely felt as this story shifts from a global spread to local intervention. Now, critically, I sought out and easily found diversity among the scientists. Many women, many people of color, many scientists and doctors from different parts of the world, especially those in countries that are the next targets of the virus in the Southern Hemisphere. I spoke with Dr. Angela Rasmussen, a virologist and research scientist at Columbia School of Public Health, about the value of diversity in science. This is what she told me. So yeah, of course, um, this is a topic that is uh, very close to my heart. Um, as academic, it's not just the media that's guilty of the sort of gender bias and, uh, and a diversity bias, I would say. Um, there is a, a prevalent myth in both the popular culture and in academic culture that science is done by these sort of lone genius dudes <laughs> who are in their labs, like working hard day and night, um, and that's all they do, and they're these sort of science machines, and that's kind of how they are immortalized. So that we're talking about people now, um, like the men who were, who were featured in that article, many of whom are, of course, great scientists. Yeah, um, taking great nothing away from them. Just, I have just nothing but respect for Dr. Fauci, um, but... Yeah. And, and he's a very accessible person too, the few times that I've met him. Um, I have nothing against any of them, but this myth that Dr. Fauci is the only person working at NIAID is, is also kind of ridiculous. Um, he is our nation's, uh, the NIH's leader of our primary infectious disease institute, but that work, um, you know, Kizmikaya Corbett is one example of uh, somebody who's not an older white man, who Works is doing there fantastic work on vaccines? Where, yes. Right on vaccines, and who I think would be, you know, we see Tony Fauci every day, and I'm I'm glad that we do. Um, but I'd really like to hear more from her um, about the work that they're doing because the work that that they've done has enabled this vaccine to go into clinical trials in record time. Now, I did take some people off my list. Not a great many, for it's not easy to fake expertise in these fields. Some amateurs and poseurs became apparent by the quality of their opinions versus facts, and by the reaction of real experts to them. Some people with very limited or irrelevant experience are trying to exploit this crisis for their own popularity. There's one scientist I won't name who does not have very relevant credentials, but who has tried to horn in on the story to get followers and clicks. His tweets looked less informed than those from other experts. I was suspicious, but didn't know enough to be able to judge him well. And then a handful of experts I talked to warned me off of him. The lesson, ask around. You don't want an echo chamber of expertise with only one viewpoint, but you also don't want to dilute the power of the expertise you find with hangers on or worse, charlatans. There have been a few notorious cases of the dangers of armchair science a so-called growth hacker from Silicon Valley who thought that because he made cyber stuff viral, he could understand viruses, and who argued that data is data, and so if he could run spreadsheets, he could grok epidemiology, wrote a notorious piece on Medium that Medium, to its great credit, took down after real experts had a fit over it. 
But this is not just a problem of social media. It's also a problem of mainstream media going to the wrong experts. TV news is bringing on a lot of very smart people with good credentials, but also some with less optimal credentials. MSNBC turns frequently to its medical contributor, Dr. David Campbell. Now, he sounds fine to me. He seems to be doing a good job. I'm not trying to be critical of him. But Dr. Dave, as they call him, is a spinal surgeon. Wouldn't it obviously be better, as Dr. Kapali said, to have an infectious diseases expert as the go-to expert in a viral pandemic? TV also re-aired an unfortunately popular YouTube video about cleaning groceries made by a general practitioner who advises washing fruits and vegetables for 20 seconds with soap and water, advice that has been debunked as dangerous. This is an example of what Claire Wardle pointed to, well-meaning ignorance. Please Google a source before quoting. And then the New York Times gave space on its op-ed page to one Dr. David Katz to argue, like the growth hacker I just mentioned, that the treatment could be worse than the disease and that we might be overreacting. He said this in March, just as we were finally implementing the controls needed to save lives. Now, similar opinions were soon heard coming from the mouth of Donald Trump. The problem is that Dr. Katz is a diet doctor, a nutritionist. A Google search of his credentials would have found that he's an advisor to the California Walnut Board. How relevant is this to a pandemic? Wouldn't it be better to have given space and that platform and voice to an epidemiologist. So I asked an epidemiologist, Dr. Greg Consalvis of the Yale School of Medicine, who has 30 years experience in HIV. On Twitter, he has been a trenchant critic of some coverage of the epidemic, including from the Times editorial pages, an echo chamber where Katz's opinions were repeated by its own columnists. Here is what Dr. Consalvis told me. Well, Look, I mean, you're a journalism professor. You know, it, I, I've been around for a long time working on HIV and other epidemic diseases. And there are amazing health reporters out there, amazing health editors out there who have won Pulitzer Prizes for their work. And they tend to sort of go with the science. So they, they triangulate and decide, um, okay, here's a claim. Let's verify it by talking to other researchers in the field. Let's go to the original articles and look what they say. Um, and so, you know, if I was Jim Dow or um, James Bennett and thinking of somebody I needed to speak to sort of the trade-offs uh, in the control of coronavirus, you know, you, there are plenty of people who um, could have been approached. Mark Liptich, who I mentioned, who's at Harvard, you know, I think tried to get uh, space on the op-ed page in the Times and, the, and they sort of, they sort of pushed him aside. You know, he's the leading expert, I would say, sort of from my field. Uh, on the disease right now in this country and has had quite a public voice in other places like Stat News and other places that are sort of more attuned to sort of the evidence base and public health reporting. You said that they went, you found it as a contrarian piece. And I think they went for the clickbait and the, the wishful thinking and easy answers, um, which, you know, no journalistic outlet, no newspaper, no, no television station should should do that. But we know the, the world we live in now where um, where, where cash is king and clickbait is, is, is not far behind. As you know, we are in a new era of open information. Doctors and scientists are sharing openly on social media. And the experts I asked welcome the opportunity to use the net to find other experts, to share questions and links, to meet new people from related fields, and importantly, to explain what is happening to the public. They are eager to get good information out to the rest of us. And considering how busy they are, they are surprisingly generous with their time and with their expertise. Dr. Rasmussen told me that this is also the first epidemic with which she has dealt with, in which scientists and academics are issuing papers as so-called preprints, that is, research papers that have not yet been peer-reviewed and approved for publication, which can take a year. Getting information more rapidly is clearly a benefit in this rapidly developing story. There is a clear risk as well. One of those preprints about a tiny clinical use of hydroxychloroquine is what led Trump to pump the drug. In this rapidly developing science and story, it is critical that we get the advice of multiple experts so we can provide context and explanation. It is also vital that we understand that science is a process. In journalism, we tend to treat the latest word as the last word. 
So before reporting about a preprint paper that reached a conclusion, or about a tweet that looks interesting, or about a discussion among doctors and scientists about a treatment, ask relevant experts about it. They will tell you what they know, and they'll tell you what they don't yet know. We must explain that the experts, too, are learning. Thanks to this era of open information, we can watch them learn and learn from them. I'll sum up my advice here. It's nothing particularly new. It's just journalism. The only thing that's new is that we have new tools through social media and the internet to find the experts, ask them questions, and amplify their expertise. So here are my thoughts. One, find relevant experts. Two, check their credentials and affiliations. Three, seek out sources with diverse background and experience. Four, ask experts what they are expert in, what they're qualified to answer. They'll tell you. Five, give relevant questions to relevant experts. Six, triangulate and ask multiple experts. Seven, keep in mind that science is a process. So is journalism. If you have any questions, I'm on Twitter. You can DM me at Jeff Jarvis.